virtual book signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg and we're at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago as usual. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. We actually have a crowd of people and so it's, that's very exciting too. If you're watching in the archives, uh, enjoy and I hope you'll, uh, if you're interested in the books and the authors we're talking about, then see if we still have a signed first edition in stock. We probably do. We try to keep them in stock for a while at least. Uh, so please do that. Um, I think we're going to have a great talk today. We have two wonderful uh, books and historians that have produced them. And I'm happy to uh, invite both of them here. Lance Hertigan from Wisconsin, award-winning journalist, has worked as a reporter and an editor, uh, especially at the UPI News Service. He's a former director of the Institute of Civil War Studies at Carroll University. Presently, he's an historical consultant for the Civil War Museum of the Upper Middle West. He's the author of many articles on the Iron Brigade, and he's considered a leading authority. Uh, there's a responsibility for you, Lance. <laughs> he's authored a number of books, including Those Damned Black Hats, Four Years with the Iron Brigade, The Men Stood Like Iron, In the Bloody Railroad Cut at Gettysburg, and today, his latest book, The Iron Brigade in Civil War and Memory, The Black Hats from Bull Run to Appomattox and Thereafter, Savis Beatty, produces it, 656 pages illustrated, and it's $39.95. By the way, it's nice to see footnotes at the bottom of pages, I love instead that. of having yeah, to go yeah. all the way in the back all the time. That's a throwback. Uh, as well, we have with us Guy Fraker, an attorney in Bloomington, Illinois, I've known for a long time. We're both on the Abraham Lincoln Association board, a past president of the McLean County Bar Association, and he's written and lectured on the Eighth Judicial Circuit, which Lincoln was famous for writing. He co-curated a traveling exhibit on the Eighth Judicial Circuit, and he's been a consultant to the PBS documentary, Lincoln, Prelude to the Presidency. He's an advisor, as I said, the Lincoln Bicentennial Commission as well. Uh, and today, finally, his book on the subject has arrived. Lincoln's Ladder to the Presidency, the Eighth Judicial Circuit, forwarded by Michael, Bur Michael Burlingame, uh, SIU, Southern Illinois University Press, 328 pages illustrated, and it's $34.95. Uh, as I always do, I'm going to ask each of you to tell us how you uh, get to this book. Uh, Lance, we'll start with you because we've already had a question emailed in by Robin from Delafield. Hello, my friend, she says. Uh, <laughs> How is the writing process for this book different than your other books? So tell us how you got to this one and what differences there might have been with the others. I, uh, I actually wanted to write a book for myself as well as, as for readers, and I was, I was interested in the human dimensions. Um, I was a reporter, of course, during the Vietnam era, and I uh, quickly became uh, uh, not very sure of official sources. And I, I wanted to, I, I, I'm more interested in how, how wars and events uh, impact on people and communities and how they change them in many ways. So I, I began to look at that. I've always been interested in the Iron Brigade. I mean, and I, the, the traditional story is, is pretty much out there. But I wanted to do a, a story of the people of the Iron Brigade and the soldiers and make them real. And, you know, they were, we, we keep forgetting when we write about, uh, like the Stonewall Brigade or the Iron Brigade, you, you think those are mythical figures, but they're really not. They have husbands and fathers and sons and and, uh, and what happened to them. And, and, and then I was also interested in how the war affected them, and it, 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 very, it greatly did. Yeah, as war seems to affect yeah, soldiers. Yeah, like everybody else, and everybody children else. and their families, and uh, so that went on and on. So the writing process was different. You know, I wanted to, I guess I wanted the, them to be remembered, because I think they wrote those letters to themselves trying to be remembered, too. And, and they deserve it. Uh, they went off to war, a war that they didn't expect, and uh, it changed them and forever, you know, ever changed the state as well. These letters that you're talking about, we'll talk about some that you've discovered as well, uh, that, or newly discovered, that, uh, you know, I've seen in 41 years here at the shop how 
how many letters there really are out there from hundreds yeah. of thousands of soldiers and families who have those letters still in their attic, and how much of that after Roots came out in the late 70s what, yeah, what brought happened, them to their attics and their ancestors. What happens is wherever I speak in Wisconsin, you know, the relatives show up and hand me letters and pictures, and, and, and that's been going on since I wrote the first book in 1990. And you know, I had all this stuff, and I said, I've got to do something with it, and so you're driven. Guy, uh, tell us as well. I mean, you've, you're right in the middle of the Eighth Judicial Circuit, That's and correct. a lawyer down there, and it's in your DNA. So I presume yeah. this is how you got to the book. It is. Uh, my book is dedicated to my Aunt Lola, and the reason is Aunt Lola, a twin sister of my grandmother, great aunt, took me to New Salem in 1948, and uh, I got hooked then. And I don't know whether to blame her or thank her, but uh, I've, I've been interested in Lincoln for that period of time. And so in a way, I've been writing this book all my life. Uh, I should, as an aside, I should say that when I was a kid in junior high school, um, I had two dreams of places I wanted to go. One was the Hall of Fame up in Cooperstown because I lived in New York. And we got that accomplished fairly quickly. The other was the Abraham Lincoln Bookstore in Chicago. This is a great <laughs> institution. And uh, it took me most of my adult life to get here. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, I, I wrote this book, though I got serious about this around the turn of the, century, uh, turn of the past century, uh, and uh, because I, I had practiced law in this, most of the counties of the circuit, I knew a lot of the people of the circuit, and I got interested in the roads, and that led me to, into the, to get interested in Lincoln's career. And uh, so I decided to do a book about the circuit. I went to Michael Burlingame, who I had a friend of mine, a mutual friend, introduced us to ask him if it was silly for me to think I could write a book because I am a practicing lawyer, not a historian, not a writer. And Michael said, well, trial lawyers tell stories all the time, so you're used to that. <laughs> so so, so uh, that's how I got into it. It took me 11 years uh, and uh, just went on forever. But what I did was take the work of the Lincoln Legal Papers, which is the finest Lincoln scholarship done in, in decades and they dug out everything they could find on Lincoln's career. And I took their work as my base research and then went into the counties and into the files and the flat files and the county histories to find out who these people were and how they related to Lincoln. So that's, that's what it's all about. To reach a conclusion, if I may, mm -hmm. that I don't think Lincoln could have become President of the United States given his coarse, raw beginnings in the 1830s if he hadn't been in Illinois, and if he hadn't developed and matured as the circuit developed and matured with the coming of the railroads, to be in a position that this was a swing state in 1860, and uh, and the, the the top guy in the swing state, in the most important part of the state at that time, was was uh, uh, going to get elected president of the United States. Well, actually, that's my first point here, and because it. Really, he grew up in a border state, did he not? That's he correct. was right in the middle of the state, and that was no different than Missouri and Kentucky, where many of the people came from, uh, into the middle of central Illinois, and uh, you know Cairo in southern Illinois came up with his first, and Illinois' first and only Confederate regiment. So that was more of a southern area, a little Egypt, and of course the north and Chicago and all was was north. Uh, so he did. He grew up in that and. Orville Burton was here with his age of Lincoln, you know Orville, right. and he argued that Illinois was a crossroads of various political stripes and helped inform and educate Lincoln. And I've always thought that there's more to the story than just what Lincoln's impact was, but what was the impact of Illinois no upon him. Um, and you know, you seem to agree, as you say in your book, a product of his place and his people, uh, to which I add maybe his time as well. So maybe briefly explain how Illinois and the circuit in particular impacted him uh, that brought him into the presidency. Yeah, that's that border state comment you made is very perceptive because central Illinois was a small version of the country. You had uh, the, the people, the state was settled from the south, so you had a strong southern leaning in central Illinois, and then as settlement later in, in the 50s particularly came from the east and the north, why then the that you had that element in the state, but the racism in central Illinois shocked me when I got into this subject matter. And Lincoln had, Lincoln, uh, and contrary to what you sometimes, what sometimes is put out there, he, he, this was not some 
a convenient card to play. He hated slavery. The reason he was a little slower than abolitionists is because he also was practical enough to know that you had to go slow. But that practicality, to some extent, came from all the good people he knew that were pro-slavery. His partner, Stewart, was pro-slavery. Anthony Thornton from Shelbyville, the fine lawyer down there. I could go on and on with pro-slavery friends of his. So he knew to moderate, and he learned to moderate his views and his judgment of people. He knew some of the nicest people in the world were pro-slavery. So he, he, he never had that enmity, personal enmity, for advocates of slavery. So the, the circuit had a tremendous impact on him in that regard. Can I just add a, a point? I had a professor at Marquette, Dr. Frank Clement, who wrote yes. four great books right. on the Copperhead Movement. He always said that the, the West, this area, Illinois, Wisconsin, whatever, he said were the first real Americans because we were starting to have this blending of, of in, in the, you know, the people, immigrant people coming in and people coming in from the South, and there was this, this first real mixing of, of society. That's a great point. That's yeah, a true. good point. I like that. Yeah, I, I always say today, Chicago is really the only American city we've got. That may be. <laughs> yeah, that is great. You know, either they're cosmopolitan or they're puritanical or whatever, but uh, I always say that too. Lance, you, in your opening, did my work for me, thank you, by <laughs> showing me all the questions I need to ask you. You, just, you asked the questions, and I'm going to ask you some of these questions. Right. Uh, but I'm first going to ask you, how did the Black Hats get their name? Well, the, the Black Hats... Uh, they, were wearing, they went to war wearing these gray uniforms, militia uniforms, gray militia, and Illinois did too. And uh, when they got there, of course, they began to switch over into the federal, into the federal uniforms. And everybody wanted those nice little kepis, those flat top caps the McClellan War. Well, they went to all the eastern regiments and not to a, a poor western regiment from Wisconsin with nobody to speak for them. So they went into the quartermaster stores and they dug out the old dress uniform of the U.S. regulars, uh, an 1858 uh, dress hat, uh, frock coat, blue frock coat, and uh, they gave them to the, to the Wisconsin boys <laughs> because nobody else wanted them. <laughs> uh, if, they, if they wore cheese on their heads, yeah, of and, yeah. <laughs> Well, we were really doing a lot of cheese in those days. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But when they got the hats, they liked them. Of course, they were, they were Western kids, and the hats gave them, they said it made them look taller. And, you know, they were big, sturdy frontier boys, and uh, they liked them. So they became well, you, known as the Black Hat Brigade. You Brigade. say that they lost that identity, though, near the end of the war. Yeah, at the end of the war yeah. in 1864, 65, they pretty much, uh, the Black Hats disappeared. Um, the 6th Wisconsin kept getting them until, until late, but by... When the from 1864-65 they they lost the, those hats. Mm -hmm. Now, when they went to Washington for the Grand Review, however, yes. all the the, the old time black hat guys with the veterans went in and bought black hats yes. to march in the parade again. So you see pictures of them all wow. outfitted with new hats and feathers. You were talking about the uh, uh, the letters that make these people yeah. come alive, the soldiers. In, in a way, it's very uh, similar guy to what you did with your interviews of descendants, and we'll get to that right after this. Uh, tell us about uh, the Harris letters, uh, Lieutenant Lloyd Harris of the 6th Wisconsin. That is a... Well, Lloyd Harrison, uh, he, uh, he became very active in the GAR movement, wrote a lot of, of, of account, you know, ad veteran stories for newspapers in Milwaukee and elsewhere. Uh, but he, uh, you know, you, you think everything's been found, and it, and it, it right. really isn't, right? right? right. Well, last year, uh, his relatives who are now living in Texas came up with 300 letters from wow. Lloyd Harris, uh, a lieutenant wow. in the 6th Wisconsin, and he writes about McClellan, as we talked about before. And so this whole, this whole thing keeps reviving itself. Uh, uh, I have found stuff since the book was published that I, I am now kicking myself. I could have waited a week, and and done a little more. So you get all these letters and, and it really gives you a different look. You know, it's one thing to say the army's short of food, but it, when you got a letter saying he had a chase, a, you know, a soldier chased a cow through some pasture and, and milked it on the, while they were wow. on the march, so he had something to eat. It's a different look. You know, when you look down, you see one reality, but when you look up, you see a different reality. So I tried to go down to the, um, it's really in, in ranks, it, if, if, it's almost, you know, I, I'm giving you their words in a lot of the cases, the stuff that they wrote and what they said and how they felt. How did they feel about uh, slavery? How did they feel about the honor? How did they feel about bravery? How did they feel about McClellan? How did they feel about Lincoln? And, 
And all of this begins to give you, a, I think, a, a much clearer picture of of soldier life and the war. It's, and it's a sad story because the war changes, of course, and they all they all uh, the end the, the war ends and makes it very difficult.